support and funding from a grant that was pr provided for us from Leahy Hospital and Medical Center and the Winchester Hospital. And Grow a Strong Family is a social service agency which provides customized family life education services to families uprooted by mental illness. And our primary mission is to offer a comprehensive menu of evidence-informed services to improve the health and well-being of our clients, um, which includes um, our fee-for-service coaching services, which, in, which is very customized to the particular needs of the family, skills-based seminars, webinars, and a support group, which are all complementary, pet therapy, which is by a certified pair and also complementary, we have a social media presence on Facebook. We have a public page where we input uh, general resources and information, and we have a private closed page where family members can gather to support each other, get answers to questions, vent at times, and also exchange resources. We are always in the process of updating our web page, so it's a good place to get some information and resources. And we collaborate collaborate with community-based agencies. In this webinar, we're going to be talking about chronic mental illness and its effect on the family, strategies for caretakers, and what self-care looks like. When your family is uprooted by mental illness, it's like being hit with a brick, just like it is with any other chronic illness. Other chronic illnesses like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, it puts a lot of demands on whomever is the primary caretaker because it's another full-time job on top of the rest of life. And mental illness in a family member creates a shift in how the family sees itself and how the family functions. Some common ways that family members tend to react includes an inability to accept the uncertainty. Whenever anybody in the family has a chronic illness, there are periods of remission and periods of great health. But the one pervasive factor is that the family is never, ever certain of what tomorrow or even later can bring. And that creates an overwhelming sense of uncertainty, of, of wariness of waiting for the other shoe to drop. Some family members respond with pessimism and doubt. Some respond with negative self-talk, typically because they take responsibility for what happens to their family members. Some family members have unrealistic expectations, consider that it's not really chronic and that it will somehow remiss and everybody will go back to normal the way it used to be. Some family members have very high standards of perfectionism and want recovery to be perfect and they want health care to be perfect. And some families are really wimpy and don't determine what their needs are and how to best stabilize the family. One of the skills I teach, it's usually the very first one, is how to breathe. I know, we all breathe. But... Getting the most from each breath is what improves our overall sense of well-being as well as providing clarity to our brains. So there's a way to do it, and the way to do it is to take a deep breath in through the nose, hold it for three seconds, purse your lips, and let the breath out slowly through your lips. So if you put your hand on your stomach, breathe in deeply so that you feel your stomach in pressing in, and then slowly let your breath out after a count of three seconds. If you do that two or three times, you'll be amazed at how calm you feel and how quickly you feel calm. You can practice this anywhere. You can practice this going to the store, waiting online, waiting to eat. You can practice this at a red light. You could practice this in a car accident. It doesn't matter where. It's a great skill, and it's a simple skill just to get yourself back to center. Another thing that we suggest is that you change the internal dialogue. Very often the way we talk to ourselves, we're not very nice to ourselves. And as caretakers, it becomes very easy to find ourselves making a great many mistakes 
and really screwing things up. So, so we have to be very careful of the internal dialogue, the words we use inside of our own heads that kind of promote our feeling of inadequacy and, over, and being overwhelmed. So when you think must, instead try thinking prefer. Instead of I must go to the store and get food in the house, think I prefer going to the store because I like having food in the house. When you think I feel so guilty, try thinking I feel so sad. When you think I should do something, think about how you're choosing to do something. It's a nice way to re-empower yourself without feeling judged or criticized or as if you're inadequate. What are some other thoughts you might have? What would be the exchange? You're allowed to talk, Shante. <laughs> oh, oh, I know, I'm listening. I, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. I'll just move on. <laughs> one of the um, one of the skills is something that's called the word exchange table. So it's if you think I am always doing something, instead try thinking I often do. Nobody is always doing something. Nobody is a bad person. Sometimes our behavior isn't as good as it is. Sometimes we feel like a failure, but we just are making mistakes because we're learning. Sometimes we ought to do something. Sometimes we would be better off doing something. It's in how you speak to yourself. The more demanding you are, the more you bully yourself, the less you're going to feel good about what you're doing, and the more likely you are to procrastinate, and that will also make you feel bad. The statements we tell ourselves, I have to do well, you shouldn't do that, you never help me, I can't stand this anymore, that can all be exchanged with saying, I want to do well. I prefer that you don't do that. You rarely help me, and this would be helpful to me. I don't like what I have to do right now. And when you start reframing it in that way, you're also giving yourself language of hope and power, but in a healthy and constructive way. In terms of emotional language, this is another way. When you feel jealous at all the attention, this is very often what siblings feel when they feel really jealous of their sibling for getting all the attention that they get. Feel concerned for the relationship. What's happening? What's going on? There's usually an imbalance in the family, and the family has to come back to a new center. And these feelings are not uncommon. Hurt because they feel disappointed. Shame because they feel regret. Guilt because they feel remorse. And, this is, and there's a wide array of emotions that family members feel. Again, find the exchange because the exchange is ultimately more helpful and gives a better promise for a constructive relationship which provides more stability for the family. We're going to be doing another thing that I always recommend is that people go ahead and dance, listen to music. <laughs> Do you see this? Aw, I hear somebody...
Moving your body, dancing, listening to music also lightens your mood. And if you have to do it in the shower, then do it in the shower. But make sure that every day you give yourself the opportunity. And what do you have? Three minutes, if that's all it takes. But doesn't it make you feel good? Don't you have a smile on your face? Didn't you sway to the music? (laughs) This one doesn't have the uh, next one, but... Research has shown that laughter is a great way to reduce stress. So what or who do you think is funny? Make sure that you provide that somehow in your life. If it's a show on the radio that you like listening to, make sure you can get it. If it's somebody you want to stream on your TV, then make sure you can do it. Even if it's five minutes, it's five minutes well spent because when you smile, you automatically release a whole bunch of neurotransmitters in your brain that are geared toward happiness and joy. And when you do that, you're already creating a foundation for a healthier day and a more um, positive and constructive ability to solve problems. Various coping strategies. Simplify your life. Keep thinking KISS. Keep it simple, sweetie. Just keep it as simple as you can. What do you need to do when you're feeling particularly overwhelmed? It's very helpful to break your day up into shorter segments. So it could be, what do I need to do in the next hour? And then if you can achieve that, what do I need to do in the next hour? Schedule time for yourself. Build it in. It is just as important as going to the doctor or going to the pharmacy or going to the store or going to work. Taking care of you has to be the highest priority. Just like they say on the airlines, when you fly, they always say put the oxygen mask on you and then on your children or your dependents because you need to be able to take care of them. They can't do it without you. So you need to take care of yourself. Make sure you plan ahead. Look at what you need to do and figure out how you can do it in the most expeditious way. Similar to what we've done when we've had gas shortages, for example, we think about, well, if I have to go into town, I can go to the dry cleaner, I can go to the supermarket, I can go to the library. So you'd be finishing all of those errands in one fell swoop rather than making three different trips. Ask for what you need. People are always offering to provide help. They'll always say, well, just let me know what you need. Uh, They're not mind readers. They don't know what you need. And the last thing anybody outside of your situation wants to offer you is more burden. So let them know what you need. It could be as simple as, oh, can you take this to the library the next time you go and give them your book or your audio? Or if you're at the store, would you mind picking up an extra lactate milk? Whatever it is. Ask for it because it's the more specific you are, the more likely you are to get it, and then it's one more thing you can write off your list. Delegate, delegate, delegate. It's a key word to good self-care. And avoid can't when you mean won't. In our family, can't was always a four-letter word, like other four-letter words, because can't really means I'm not able to. Most of the time we're not, we are able to, but we would prefer not to. So don't say can't. They won't. Another thing to do is to manage your time more effectively, like we've talked about. Learn to say no. If, the, if anybody needs an answer right now in the moment and you haven't had a time to look at your calendar or assess, is this really the best use of my energy or is this the best way for me to use my resources, then the answer in the moment has to be no. But if they can give you time to think about it, come back at them with, uh, can I get back to you and let you know what I think in another two or three hours or in another day or let me look at my calendar. If possible, whenever you're asked to do anything that isn't regarding what has to be done in your day-to-day, then give yourself permission to assess if it makes sense for you to do it. So saying no if they need an answer right this minute, otherwise let me get back to you and give a time frame for that because that holds you to prevent it from lingering, which creates more stress for you, but it also gives them an answer in a timely manner. 
Mm-hmm. And develop an attitude of gratitude. Even though the current situation can be very difficult, there are always things that you can appreciate about it, even if it's as mm-hmm. simple as, I'm glad I'm able to do this today. Yeah. Mira, the uh, icon, the little icon, the picture you put there, it's called gratitude. Yeah, right I know, I see slide. it. Did you know? Okay. Yeah, I yeah. Know I had two different shows, but okay. yeah, thanks. I had two different okay. shows, and this is the one that was in the format. So, okay. how am I doing so far? You're doing great. I'm loving listening to this. It's great. You sound <laughs> really good. Didn't come out right either. You explain really well. Oh, okay. And helpful self statements again, going back to what's going on between your ears. So just like the train going up the hill, I know I can do this, I know I can do this, you can do this. Even if it means it's hard, things that are hard to do are hard, that doesn't mean that they're impossible. And you're doing them one minute at a time. So Mm -hmm. instead of thinking, oh, this is too hard, try thinking instead it's hard and I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. The other thing you do is just say, I'm going to take one step at a time. And sometimes that step means staying in place. Sometimes it means going back a step. But it's still movement, regardless of which direction you're going in. It's still movement. Mm -hmm. Make sure you eat nutritiously. If you don't eat well, your your immune system is going to suffer, and then you won't be well. If you're not well, who's going to take care of you and your loved one? Mm -hmm. So you really need to stay well. Try something new. Every day, even it could be a new snack, it could be a shift in your routine, anything you do that's even a new show, a new piece of music, whatever it is, trying something new provides a constructive, again, neuro, it's, it's the neurotransmitters in the brain that respond very favorably to learning something new on a daily basis. And that reinforces itself by strengthening your immune system. You need to get a good night's sleep. If you're not getting a good night's sleep, you need to figure out how you can do that. Sometimes these situations are overwhelming and medication may be helpful to help resolve the excess stress. Sometimes it's taking yoga, going back to your breathing. It could be needing to be in another room. It really depends, but you need to figure out how you can get a good night's sleep. And going back, let's don't forget, breathe deeply and often. Look at your expectations. Are they reasonable? Do they make sense? Are, they, are you able to fulfill them? Are the people around you helpful? Are they able to fill, fulfill them? Deal with problems as they appear. Don't future trip. Not useful, not helpful. Figure out what you need to do to manage what's going on in your life right now. Anything you can let go of, let go of. It's not important. If it's important, it'll still be important tomorrow. You don't need to focus on it today. Make time for fun. If you don't have fun, all work and no play makes every caretaker dull, irritable, and grouchy. That's no good for anybody. You really have to put your energy into your important relationships other than the relationship you have with your loved one that you're caring for. And the way that you do this is is the same way I mentioned earlier, which is scheduling time for yourself, schedule time for your friends. Everybody has to eat organically. The easiest way to have maintain your relationships with the important people in your life is to get together around the meal. It could be lunch. It could be dinner. It could be an hour. It could be at your place in a different room. Get creative about this, but make sure that you reach out to the people who have been your strongest supporters when things were going well because they probably still want to be your stronger supporters, and it helps you not to shut them out. Stay healthy. Invest in your well-being. These words are bad words. I'm telling you right now, as soon as you hear should, ought, must, have to, you need to turn it off. Those are bad words. It's like walking in a bad neighborhood. you got to say should, should, no, no. We don't do should, ought, must, have to. What we do is what would I prefer, what are my choices, What are the options that are available to me? What is the time frame that I can manage these in? Say the serenity prayer. I find it really helpful. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, 
and the wisdom to know the difference. When you put things in the order, this is also helpful, and I've created a visual that goes along with it. I call it the serenity prayer grid. Things I cannot change are things I have to accept because I can't penetrate that. We can't change our loved one's diagnosis. We can't change how they're managing or not managing their care. And so how can I accept the things I cannot change? That becomes the focus of that. When you have courage, you're thinking, these are the things I do have control over. I have control over the food I have in my house. I have control over the kind of schedule I want to have. I have control over how I spend my time. So this is what it can look like. Isn't that nice, the way that grid makes things easier? Yeah. Give yourself permission. Accept some things are out of your control. Life happens. It's not all or nothing. We're not meant to be perfect. Be willing to be willing. Do your part. Show up. But live your life one day at a time because that's all we have anyway. And sometimes when I work with clients, I say to them, what are you going to do today to take care of yourself? What's the one thing you're going to put in place for yourself today? What is the one thing you're going to put in your place, in, in, put on your calendar for tomorrow? And for the next day. So I have people planning for today, tomorrow, and the next day. I'm going to spend 15 minutes doing a mindfulness meditation, and I'm going to get up extra early, and I'm going to do it between 6 and 6.15. Now I have a plan. I'm much more likely to follow through with it. You see? That's how this works with self-care. We get out of the habit of taking care of ourselves when a loved one is diagnosed with a chronic illness that requires our participating in their care. And we do that because all chronic illnesses start out as acute illnesses. And when they become chronic, it's almost as if we forget how to shift back from the acute care to long-term care. And we have to respond differently over the long haul. Nobody can maintain that, that, that intensity of an acute episode to any length of time and still be a high-functioning, happy, joyful, healthy person. And that's why it is so important as caretakers with loved ones with chronic illnesses to figure out how to rebuild, how to take care of myself and how to give myself a life. That's in addition to the caretaking. These are some very helpful resources that I have found that are especially useful. One of the, the probably one of the most effective is Byron Katie's um, material called The Work. And she has a wonderful tools on how to combat and challenge some of the ways we think about ourselves and ways we interpret the experience that we have of our world. Sark is a delightful author, illustrator, philosopher who has wonderful, colorful books to help us reclaim the joy in our lives. Uh, Sherry McGregor has written a book on rejected parents for parents of estranged adult children, since this is often something that family members have to endure when a loved one has a chronic illness. And the other resources are also helpful. When best laid plans fail, because even with all of this, stuff happens. What I always recommend is stick to your normal routines as much as possible, whatever they are. We all find security in doing what we typically do. So when we are beset with times of difficulty, we can always fall back to whatever our normal or typical days are. Eat and drink in moderation. Don't bury yourself in food or drink. Plan on exercise. Build in nature time. There is so much research that talks about the benefits of nature, even if it just means staring at your window at a tree. If that's the case, focus on the shape of the tree, the texture of the tree, the color of the tree. Are there any creatures on the tree? Um, It will help, believe it or not. That's what the research has been informing us very consistently. Make sure you have a plan B and a plan C. We could never be stuck with only a plan A. So make sure that you have plan B and plan C for the unexpected. This way, you're not thrown off guard. Forewarned is forearmed. Keep music you love on hand and listen to it when you need to. Music that gets you dancing, laughing, crying, whatever it is 
that cleanses your soul, that feels healing to you, make sure that it is always accessible. That's why Alexa from Amazon is so useful because you can just say, Alexa, play me Enya, and the next thing you know, you're listening to it, what works for you without even having to decide what that's going to be. Prioritize your time, activities, and commitments. Do what you want to do and do what you can do. And at all times, take good, loving care of yourself. So in this webinar, what we've discussed is chronic mental illness and its effect on the family, strategies for caretakers, and strategies for self-care. If, you're, if you want any more information about Grow a Strong Family or how to access a recording of this or some of the handouts, I will make them available.